Thanks, Brittany. How is everybody? Good. I swear there were 600 chairs in here when I looked this morning, but there's only, they've assured me there's only 200. So, uh, Well, I just wanted to um, say thanks for letting me come up here. Uh, I attended the Michael Kaufman CM, which was awesome at the IRT. And when Brittany contacted me, I thought it was to provide breakfast. Um, but uh, so I, I was honored to, uh, to do more than that. Um, so just a little bit of a brief history, and then I want to go into kind of my perception of, of the theme and how I interpret it a little bit. Um, I'm gonna talk about time as it relates to balance, and uh, balance through passion, path, and priority, kind of my three, three things I wanted to hit on. Um, so Brittany was nice to say, talk about me as the founder of Cerulean Restaurant. So graduated from Taylor University, grew up in Goshen, Indiana, um, moved back to Winona Lake in Warsaw area, cornfield, the cornfield, the cornfield. Um, <laughs> Brittany's from Bourbon, Indiana, so she's from a cornfield too, uh, which is also the coolest name of a town in Indiana, Bourbon. Um, so, <laughs> but after Taylor, I went uh, there for a uh, degree in finance, but I always wanted to open an, a business that was my own and um, kind of start something new and, and get out of Indiana as fast as possible. Uh, so went to Taylor University, graduated, saw an opportunity in Warsaw, Indiana to start a catering company um, and to help out a friend of mine, but I, I only committed a year to it and then I was gone again from Indiana as fast as possible. Um, luckily, I got married at the age of 22 and then opened the catering company at the age of 22 and then started Cerulean Restaurant at the age of 23. Uh, so this, again, is 10 years ago, little town, 5,000 people, went on a lake in Indiana. So my wife and I um, started out and we said, hey, let's create a restaurant of things that we like to eat in a town that nobody will eat them. And uh, <laughs> it was a great, great business plan. Uh, so we started Cerulean and cried ourselves to sleep every night for a couple of years, 23 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. The first year where we opened, we did 50,000 people in the restaurant, town of 5,000. 50,000 people came in the front door. We had like 75 seats, something like that. Um, so again, no idea what we were doing. We, we battled through it, um, got a lot of smart people to help us out. And since then, I've opened um, Cerulean Indianapolis three years ago, Light Rail Cafe and Roaster and went on a lake, went on a Heritage Room. Um, and a couple other things. We have three children, three and a half, one and a half, and coming in March. Um, but I tell people, I'll head this off now from the Q&A time, no more children, that's it. Um, I'm absolutely committed to the process, though. So uh, <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I say. Uh, so <laughs> I hope my wife doesn't watch this. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's just a really quick snapshot of, of my life. Um, been absolutely passionate about food and community, and I think it's it's really neat to be in Indianapolis with kind of what the Alexander's trying to do and bring people together and uh, you know, facilitate that community. Um, I think what is really neat about, I'll say our generation, is that I can't ever imagine my parents looking at me and saying, you know what we'd really like our son to do is start a restaurant or a brewery or a tea company, right? Um, and, and so now that we, we, people in this room and people that do what I do have chosen that path. You know, my parents didn't impress upon me, you know, they were like, be a lawyer, be a doctor, you know, whatever it was. It wasn't be a chef, work a thousand hours a week, you know, all those hard things. And so I think there's absolutely 100% of food revolution happening across the country. It's been happening for years, and Indianapolis is there, right? Four years ago when we built this restaurant, I remember moving into downtown Indianapolis in Cityway right next door. I didn't bring a kettle, a grinder, or a French press. I couldn't walk and go get those three things in Indianapolis. It was impossible to walk and go get a coffee grinder, a French press, and a kettle. I got the kettle at TJ Maxx. That was it. Um, and so Indianapolis has come a long, gigantic way in four years with that food revelation, revolution, and it's really neat to be a part of it. Um, so now I, I go from that and I say time, right? I had a conversation with a farmer a couple of years ago about time, and he, he looked at me like I was crazy, and he's like, there's plenty of time. You just stop sleeping as much, right? <laughs> I, I thought about that. Right? And I'm laying in bed thinking about that a couple years ago. And then I'm watching House of Cards and Frank Underwood's like, you know, time puts the most powerful man on his back because you've got to sleep. So then I'm thinking about what does time really mean to me? 
And I think at the end of the day, it's about balance. Um, and so how did we start and what sets us up for success? I'll use Cerulean as an example, but I want you to kind of fill in these blanks. Um, when we started nine years ago, like I said, we had no idea what we were doing, but we had this core belief and we did something for a reason. Um, and I'll go to this. This is the only slide I'm going to use today. But uh, has anyone ever read or seen this golden circle? Simon Sinek, Start With Why, great book. Um, I won't do his TED talk, I promise. But this really changed the way that we thought and it really explained for the first time why I do what I do. Um, so if you look at this golden circle, it starts with, with why at the core, how and then what. And I want to talk about each of those three things. Um, so this is our passion statement at Cerulean, Light Rail, Heritage Room, Coffee Roaster, whatever you want to say, fill in that blank. But ours is through Cerulean, at its best and at every level, we're about communication, communion, and joy while encouraging a modern sensibility that inspires. That's our passion statement. That's why I wake up every single day. Um, I could talk about that for the whole morning, but I won't. Um, and when you break that down, we say through something. So through food and beverage, right? That's our, that's our, that's our catch. That's what we do. How do we do it? Great people. We source amazing food and product. Why do we do what we do? To create communion and communication at the table while ins inspiring you know, this modern sensibility through art, decor, whatever it is. What, what we want you to do at the table or in the chair or in the building or in the space or in the room is set the phone down. Sorry, I'm using the phone. Set the phone down and look at the person across from you and you know, at least communicate with them. If you can get past that and you can enter into some form of communion with this deeper sense of communication and sharing of beliefs or ideas, that's for us when we have the victory. So 10 years ago, we bought 60 chairs um, from Herman Miller, Eames chairs. Uh, it's a polypropylene chair, Eiffel base. Is anybody familiar with the chair? It's a site, yeah. So it's this, it's this plastic little chair that was designed in the 50s and it's a beautiful chair, beautiful piece of design by Ray and Charles Eames. And through the years, we've had people sit in this chair that is actually pretty expensive. And they've said, what is this cafeteria piece of junk, right? But you know what? When I hear that at the table, I smile because that's a victory. Because they've, they've just stopped everything else and they've talked about something that's around them. You know, honestly, like they've communicated, they've, they've shared something that it's broken the barrier. You know, when they look at the art or they look at something around them, the architecture, the doorknob on the bathroom, the kind of tile we chose, they can talk about that. That's a victory for us. That's why we do what we do. How do we do it? We hire amazing people, we source the best product, and oh, by the way, we cook food and serve drink. Does that make sense? That's absolutely 100% why I wake up in the morning. Um, and that's really exciting. I don't want to get too, too far down that. Um, so then the question becomes, how do we win hearts before minds? And how do we get people to follow hearts and not logic, right? So how do we balance the pursuit of getting people to follow heart and not logic? Um, and this is, this is the hard part, at least for us. You know, Michael, I thought it was really neat, talked about a little bit about disruption, if you were there. So you walk this fine line in business between education, maybe a little bit of disruption, and going out of business, <laughs> right? So especially with food, it's so intensely personal. I could put a plate in front of you that's, that's taken us all day to create, and you absolutely hate it. Or 99 of you might love it. And so it's, it's completely, completely personal. Um, and so it's, 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 an, it's intensely hard. Um, but I think the interesting thing about that and why we're all here is creativity demands that we travel unknown paths, right? We go down, we put a plate of food in front of you that we have no idea if you're going to like. We don't know if it's going to work. And we wait for you to take that first bite. If you like it, you come back. If you don't, you never walk in our door again. We have five seconds. You know, same thing with what a lot of you guys do. Um, and so I, we asked ourselves at Cerulean and, and my wife and I in, in the businesses that we start and what we do, we say, how do we create an unmade future? Okay? And we've come up with this idea that we foster conditions in which creativity can emerge and flourish. So it's planned out. And in, in nature, I think I, I compared a little bit, to, and this is Dan Barber, the third plate, if you've read that a little bit, he talks about the edge effect. And that's a spot in nature where the sea comes into the shore, right? There's an intense amount of life there. And there's this, this great vast space that's a little bit boring. 
And then as it comes closer, you get this edge effect where there's this flourishing amount of life and activity. Right? And so then it becomes, we ask ourselves, how do we stand in that space where there's so many unknowns, so many mistakes that can happen, how do we flourish in that space of intense activity in life? And how do we not only stand there and flourish, how do we become comfortable standing there and, and failing or making mistakes or crossing from the woods through the brush into the open field? Edge effect there too in nature. And so we say, how do we create that environment for our staff, for our customers, all those great, amazing people that believe in what we believe and want more than just what we have. And we do this through a little bit, um, a couple things that I'll talk about in a second, but there's that sweet spot there, like I talked about, and that edge effect, that we make mistakes and we're comfortable with it. Um, so one of the greatest mentors I've had in my life is a, a gentleman named Dane Miller. He passed away this year, founded Biomet, um, sold it for $12 billion last year. And he's from Winona Lake, Indiana. Um, really, really cool guy. Um, but I, I went to him one day. He was a mentor of mine for five years. His office was down the street from Cerulean Winona Lake, and I had the opportunity to go in his office anytime I wanted and ask him a question. And I went to him one day and I said, Dane, I feel like I'm failing every single day that I wake up. And, he's, and he looked back at me and he said, are you learning something? And I stopped and I said, absolutely. He said, well, then you're not failing. You're in that, that space, that edge effect, that area of nature where there's an intense amount of life and you're understanding that failure is okay. Mistakes are not a necessary evil. They are not even evil at all. And when you can become comfortable standing in that space and understanding that, then I think you, you enter into the ability to have some creativity. Um, the other thing that Dane said to me was, he said, be comfortable making those mistakes, but, but be wrong as fast as you can. So I kind of say it's like, if, if, as a grown adult, if I had never ridden a bike, I want to get on a bike, and you told me to ride a bike for the first time ever, I know I'm going to fall, right? So what do, I, do I go get like this 10-foot high unicycle? No, I go get the smallest freaking bike that I can find, and I put all the pads on, and I go out in grass, and I ride it, and I fall over. And I do it as fast as I can, and then I get back up, and I keep going as fast as I can. So we, we, we're in that edge effect. We know we're going to fail, but how do we do it quickly? How do we adapt, and how do we move forward? That's what we're all about on a day-to-day -day basis. And then creating that environment where people can, can thrive in there and be comfortable. Um, so, I'm talking really fast, sorry. I want to get through a lot. Uh, so we talked about mistakes being inevitable. Um, I think that in our business and, and probably in all of yours, without mistakes, there's no originality. And so I think, again, that's why we have to be comfortable making them. This is why I'm married, but telling the truth is the only way to ensure excellence. My wife reminds me of that every day. Um, so trying to surround ourselves with people that can be candid. I like that word. Um, Ed Catmull uses it in Creativity, Inc., another great book. He, he puts people around himself that can be candid every single day. And I think more importantly than being candid is the timing of being candid, because you have to present the truth at, an, at a time that it can help a person grow. Right? So if I tell you something that's absolute truth, but it's too late, it doesn't help you at all. It's not constructive. So again, we try to create situations that we can be candid with each other, create truth, create excellence, and do it with the right timing. I think that's key. Um, and I think when all those things align, it's really exciting. So I talked a little bit about that failure. And when you learn it, that means you've got to surround yourself with people that care about what you care about, that believe in what you believe, and that when you allow for them to be candid, there's no repercussion for that, right? So at Pixar, what Ed Catmull talked about is that any level of person can talk to anybody, anytime, for any reason with no repercussion, breaking down all those barriers. And I think that's really important with organizations that want to succeed is, is that there's a not only a level of candor, but a level of acceptance of it at any level without repercussion. And I think when you, when you do that in the right space and allow for mistakes, creativity just goes through the roof. Um, and I think that's really, really exciting, especially with food and beverage um, and hospitality. How many people have worked in hospitality industry ever? Okay. All the people with your hands down are the smartest people in the room for sure. <laughs> um, but it, it's an intense world and, it, and it's a lot of hours and it's a lot of time and it's a lot of commitment. But again, when you get that smile, at that table or in that room, it's the greatest feeling in the entire world. Um, 
So learning from failure, surrounding ourselves with people who care about us, can talk to us and be honest, people like my wife, maybe it's an executive team, maybe it's people within your team or a small group. Um, you have to see what you're looking at. Does that make sense? So you have to see what you're looking at. It's more than just seeing it. You have to understand it and see what you're looking at. Um, King philosopher Rudolf Steiner said, was asked, what does the betterment of humanity require? And he said, to, in order to improve and make true progress, we need to understand that the heart is not a pump. Okay? Um, Dan Barber talks about this in the third plate too. But he was asked, and he gave three answers, but the one that's the most impactful, I think, is that the heart is not a pump. And you step back for a second and you think about that. So science says that the heart's a pump and it pumps blood. But when blood actually enters the heart and leaves the heart, it's entering and leaving at the same speed. Are there any doctors here? Because don't fact check me on this. <laughs> the blood enters the heart and leaves the heart at the same speed. Okay? And when it enters, the heart acts as a dam, slows the blood down, regulates it, sends it back out at the same speed into the you know, capillaries and venous system. So it acts as a chamber. The blood drives the heart, not the other way around. The heart doesn't drive the blood. The blood drives the heart. So what does the heart do? I think what Steiner was trying to say is the heart listens. It listens to the blood. It listens to what's happening in the body. It slows things down. It acts like a dam, and then it sends it back out. Um, I think people have thought about that for like 50 years, but that was the 22nd. So then we talk about ba balance and priority. And this, for me, is probably the hardest part of my life. So I think all of us in this room, when we wake up, we make a decision about who we're going to steal time from, or who, I'll say who we're going to cheat, even though that sounds bad. You know, I wake up and I say, all right, what's not getting my time today? Is it my family? Is it my religion? Is it my partner or my spouse or my wife or my friends? Is it my children? Is it my business? They're all not going to get it. So who, who's going to get it today? It almost makes you cry thinking about it, right? Especially when you have children. Who's going to get your time? Um, when you surround yourself with people that believe in what you believe and don't just want what you have, they forgive you. Okay? I want my children to understand why I do what I do so they can forgive me. I want my wife to understand why I do what I do so she can forgive me. I want my customers to understand why I do what I do so they can forgive me. So that when you walk in and you have 99 great experiences and that plate's wrong once, you say, that's okay, I forgive you. Because I understand why you do what you do. Building a customer that understands why you do what you do, building a team that understands why you do it, there's nothing more powerful in the world. It makes you feel absolutely 100% supported. And you could wake up every single day not wanting to make money, but doing why you want to do what you do. I can honestly say I don't, I shouldn't say 100, I don't think I can ever remember a time where I've woken up, sat up out of bed, took a breath like I meant to, and said, I have to make money today. I think about why I want to do what I do, and I drive me, and all those other things come later. Now, an accountant will be like, all right, no margin, no mission, right? Which is true, absolutely. But that's a byproduct of why we do what we do. And if I can't do what I do and feel great about that why, everything else can go away as far as I'm concerned. So we reveal why we do what we do three ways. Through our story. Unapologetically, we tell our story, days like today, to the customer whenever we can. We put words on the menu, like the word Sitka, right? Sitka salmon. What does that mean? How does that invoke some kind of reaction from the guest of maybe not even understanding what that means. And then there's a conversation with the server. Um, we tell it on a website. We tell it through social media. Anything we can, unapologetically tell your story. Because it, it gives people a glimpse into why you do what we do. Had anybody here understand our, our passion before I started talking? Probably not. There's, a, there's this kind of thing called conscious capitalism. You start a business for the right reasons. And companies that do this, it's been shown, best practitioners outperform the S&P 10 to 1. So if you believe in why you do what you do, it translates to margin, right? You outperform 10 to 1. It's been proven 
top 500 companies in the world. And I think what's interesting to take away about that is the most successful companies have a mission behind them and the most successful nonprofits function like companies, right? Um, the second way we talk about and reveal why we do what we do is through our staff. It's through the people we surround ourselves with, right? It's those people that believe why you do what you do, that, that are able to forgive you. Um, so I'll just bring it back to Cerulean. We don't hire people that are maybe, somebody is going to kill me that works at Cerulean. Rue, sorry. We don't necessarily hire people that are extremely skilled in what they they're do, but they have a great, <laughs> 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 don't tell anybody. They have a great heart. Number one, absolutely have to have a good heart and then we can train them to do things, or their skills will shine through. But number one, who is this person? At their core, who are they? Are they can they sign on a dotted line, this is why I work at Cerulean or Light Rail or whatever, fill it in? Can they, you know, with blood say, this is why we do what we do? You, blood later today. <laughs> um, so lastly, I want to talk about the thing that I think is most powerful that tells why you do what you do is that last outer circle, your what? Your products. Maybe your products are yourself. Maybe you own your own company and you're writing a blog. Maybe it's a restaurant. Maybe it's a marketing team. Whatever it is, it's a product. Um, without a doubt, quality is the best business plan, right? Everybody's all about quality, quality, quality. But it's absolutely the best business plan. It's not a consequence of following a set of behaviors, rather a prerequisite and mindset you must have before you set out to do what you do. So it, it's at the core. It's that why why we do what we do. And then it, it permeates through all those rings. So what's really interesting, I think, with quality, and it, I don't even know if I can call myself a chef anymore, but at one time I was a chef, is that when you are a chef and you intensely care about quality, you start to try to identify the best ingredients in the world, or maybe in Indiana, or maybe your back door. So you try to find the best tasting food that you can find, right? Simplify that. When you start to do that, you start to promote healthy environments, whether you mean to or not. So what I think about, what does my food eat, right? If I'm eating a pig, what's that pig eating? Is it eating grass? Is it eating corn? Is it eating GMO whatever? And then it starts to become a mission to find the tastiest foods. And as you start to find the tastiest foods, you find the foods that are produced and harvested in the best way possible. So nine years ago, I didn't understand much about salmon. Let's use this as one example. So I, I was on a quest to find the best tasting salmon that I could find. Let's just say personally. And Norwegian farm-raised salmon, Chilean farm-raised salmon that comes in the United States isn't actually salmon, it's trout. The FDA lets us, if it's pink and it looks red, you can call it anything you want when it comes in the United States. So some of us in this room have probably never tasted salmon, even though we've had it on menus hundreds and hundreds of times. So, then we start to, to look at how in the, even more challenging, how in the Midwest do we find salmon, right? We're a landlocked, in the middle of nowhere, you know, in Manhattan, the slang for a hillbilly is a Hoosier, right? So how do I get salmon, right? How do I find salmon in Indiana? So all of a sudden, we, we, we find a company that sells salmon out of Sitka, Alaska, one of the last remaining small towns, small fisheries in the, in the United States. Not only does that town sell salmon to Indiana, that town links it to the boat that sells salmon. Not only does the town link it to the boat and the company link it to the boat, they link it to the fishermen. So in Indiana, I can sit here and tell you you're eating wild Alaskan salmon from the fishing vessel Loon from Kirk Hardcastle and his family. They live in Sitka, Alaska. They live in Juneau, wherever it is. I can link the fish you eat in Indiana to a fisherman. It's the same concept as a farmer, right? But it's in, it, incredibly harder to do in, in Indiana. And, and through that search, not only have I become a chef, but I've become a gastronome. Not only have I become a gastronome, but I've become an environmentalist. Whether I've meant to become an environmentalist or not, I've just sourced a wild Alaskan fish. We export $15 billion of seafood. We import, sorry, we export $5 billion of seafood. We import $15 billion. That trade deficit is over $10 billion in fresh, wild, product from the United States that's shipped overseas to people that care more about quality than we do. 5% of Americans give a shit about food, taste, and quality. The other 95% just want to survive and eat. So how do you build something, educate a community, educate Indianapolis on a salmon that was 
raised wild in, a, in, you know, in Alaska from a fishing vessel loon from a, this guy. And whether they know that or not, and whether they ask about that word on the menu or not, that's a victory. It's the same thing as the chair. You look at that person eating that salmon and you say, we won today. And that's what, how, and why we do what we do. Um, I could talk about salmon all day too if you can't tell. <laughs> so I was in Chicago last weekend with a fisherman that caught a salmon that you might have eaten here in Indianapolis from Sitka, Alaska. And I was talking to him about his fishing practices. We were drinking a glass of wine and we were talking about terroir of the wine, the air, the climate, the soil, everything that goes into that glass. And he said something deeper. He said, when I'm drinking this wine with you right here, that's the final link of terroir because I'm in a great mood and I'm having a great time and I'm always going to remember this glass of wine. And he said, when I catch a salmon on my boat, if I'm in a bad mood, I don't go fishing because I care that much about my salmon in Alaska getting to your plate with the right terroir. Does that blow your mind? It's probably the only guy like that in the world. <laughs> uh, but that's why we do what we do. Am I over? Um, and so I guess the challenge for me in Indiana, and I can now say, I told you I tried to get out of Indiana twice, I now unapologetically live in Indiana. And now every day, not only do I wake up trying to figure out why I'm going to do what I do, but I wake up trying to say, how do we break down coastal arrogance in Indianapolis? How do we break down coastal arrogance in Indiana? And, and for me, my every day, maybe that's having a restaurant in northern Indiana, in central Indiana, and taking those farms and put them in the back of my car and taking them up to another cornfield to utilize 40 farms in Indiana instead of 20. Maybe that's building your team. Maybe that's telling your story. Whatever that is, wake up every day trying to figure it out. Henry Ford said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. You heard that one? Being a creative leader is seeing what most of us can't, giving us products that give life to our why that we would never dream of asking for. If you had entered this market four years ago and you had asked Indianapolis what they wanted, they would have said more steak. They would have said more chains. There's 130 restaurants within eight blocks of this location doing more than just serving steak. And they have to have more than 5% of this nation go in and, and give them business, right? The other 95% that don't care, that's who we're after. That's why I wake up. That's why we put a restaurant in the middle of nowhere in a parking lot that in 2012 was Eli Lilly's parking lot. How do we link Fountain Square and Fletcher Place to downtown Indianapolis? Is it a YMCA that's gonna do 3,000 people in four days a day? Maybe. Is it taking a risk that might fail? Is it falling down? Is it figuring which bike to get on? How many pads to wear? Absolutely. Does it mean losing money sometimes? 100%. I want to read, kind of finish up with a, a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, the man in the arena. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither, neither have known victory nor defeat. So whether you start your own company or you work in a great one, or it's just you working by yourself for the rest of your life, please, I beg you, know why you do what you do and do it with a clarity that's backed by passion. Thanks. Q&A? Yeah. Absolutely. It's the hardest thing in the world. And, you know, you impress, you know, each one of these restaurants, each one of these spaces has an executive chef. And you, you try to impress upon that person, this isn't about what you can do. 
This isn't about you. This is about how well you can train all those guys on the line to, to do what you want them to do or to express themselves or to give them a, a, a time and a place to express themselves. Um, you'll see restaurants that, you know, on a Saturday night after work, they're there for the next four hours creating dishes and giving people a chance to make a dish. Um, so again, I think you have to foster that space, like I talked about, that, you know, that edge zone that allows chefs and cooks to come back and get back into it. In Winona Lake, nine years ago, we had two guys that left for the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park. They went there. The, one of them came back and worked at Alinea. The other one went back to, and worked at the Little Nell in Colorado. They both worked there for a year, and then they came back to Winona Lake to work at Cerulean. Because we had the, the amazing chefs that just spent $80,000 learning how to cook to make six, you know, whatever minimum wage was, $7 an hour. But they came back because they had the ability to create. They chose one of the top three restaurants in the world and another one, a great one in Col Colorado, to leave and come back to, to Indiana, right? And that's that boomerang that we have to have happen. And, and when we allow people to be creative and leave and find out and, and go see what things are all about, awesome. But then they, we've got to give them the room to come back and create, whether that's a guy or a dishwasher, whoever that is. You know, at, at, at all these restaurants, we're open book. That means QuickBooks is open in the office. You can go and you can see how much linens cost. You can go and you can see any, anything about the restaurant financially that you want to see, it's open book. Because you, from the dishwasher to the line cook to the chef, they have to believe in it and understand why and, and why it's important, how to create in the right space, and then put it on a, on a dish. Yeah, that's probably what you thought I was going to talk about the whole time, huh? Um, you know, a restaurant is, is really interesting when you talk about literal time. Like she said, you know, you, you spend your whole life, and in that bite, you might get total rejection, you know? It's really tough. Um, but again, you have to learn how to keep going. I don't think we're seeing it in Indianapolis yet, honestly. What I think is happening is that restaurants are going at a faster rate than we have talent to, to hire. And I think the, pa the talent pool is kind of ankle deep. And so you see, what you're going to see is, I think wages rise for those positions in Indianapolis because you're going to have to pull people from other cities. But our cost of living here, I think, is so affordable. And there's still these outskirts of great pockets and great neighborhoods that you can afford to live and have service industry. That's maybe not the case in Chicago or New York or LA. And so I think you're going to see, you're going to see the cream kind of rise to the top as far as restaurants. And I think you're going to see um, the city build professionally to support that. Does that answer your question? Kind of? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's really tough, especially in that industry where there's you know one position that you're, everyone's trying to be. And I don't I don't know if I have an answer for it, except that. You know, like I said, I think you have to give someone the table to be able to create. And if they can do that, you have to reward them. So when we started Cerulean Indianapolis, we didn't start it because we felt like the business was here. We started it because I had two chefs in Winona Lake that had been to the Culinary Institute of America. We now had four chefs in our kitchen in a town of 5,000 people. I needed a place to take that talent so that they could express themselves. And Indianapolis happened to be that, that city. We didn't start a restaurant because because of whatever external factor. We started it because of people and talent, and we needed a place for them to expand. So I think when you have like this Zingerman's model in Ann Arbor, when you look at Zingerman's in Ann Arbor, if you've ever been there, it's this like business after business after business that this guy owns on a, you know, oh, you like to do cheese? Great, well, let's open a creamery. Oh, you like to do ice cream? Let's open a gelato shop. Oh, you like to bake bread? Let's open a bakery. And so you take people that are really great at what they do, and you enable them to do it. You know, is that 500 people? No, but is, it's a couple special people, and I think that's, I think that's where Indianapolis has to go. You hear, as a chef, you can be a, a taking chef or a giving chef, right? And when you're a giving chef, you're taking people with talent and you're putting them into the community and you're, maybe you're supporting them financially, maybe you're supporting them with you know, a, a way to express creativity. Whatever it is, you have to support that person. You have to give them to Indianapolis. Yeah, it's kind of the terroir, right, of eating. So in Winona Lake, we have a company called Mudlove Pottery. Here, we use Van Hoy. And, and Man, it'd be a cool dream, right, to just have like a pottery shop in your restaurant that produces plates, and then you can look at the guy making your plate, you're eating on the plate, you know. <laughs> there's a farm, you know, there's this like, there's no like monoculture, it's just this, you know, really great environment. But I think that's a huge part of it. And I think when you can tell that story, dining becomes entertainment. And I think that's really powerful too. I, you know, there's, there's plenty of places, I have to be really careful what I say, 
you can go in lots of restaurants with exposed light bulbs and reclaimed wood and all that great stuff, and there's always a place for that because we all want to feel comfortable. We need, a, you know, the gastropub and, and the, you know, the speakeasy or whatever it is. But there's also a place where food has to become entertainment, and that's how a city grows. Yeah, good question. I tell people, I think it'd be easier to have 12 restaurants in one city than two in two different cities. When you look at Paul Kahn's model in Chicago, he owns some great restaurants. He can bike to every single one of them. Um, and that's really selfish, sorry. But, you know, I think that what I see in my, if, if I'll, I'll talk about me for a second, what I see is that my job, and I think the job of a leader, and I don't want it to be about me, it could be the next guy too, has to come in and has to unify all those fronts, right? And you step into a restaurant for a day and you say, okay, I'm laying the track. You guys got to get on the train and drive down it. I don't know where we're going and it doesn't really matter, but how do we all come together towards a common goal and get it done, right? And so I think, and I'm not good at it, <laughs> but I think that's, that's the goal of someone with different hats is to you know, walk into that room and, and inspire people to get to where they're going or f figure it out along the way.